Hello fellow teachers and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox and I'm excited to spend some time in the scriptures with you today. And we're going to be covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 12 and 13 and then we're going to finish up Joseph Smith history covering verses 66 through 75. Now, my goal with these lessons is not only to give you insight into the scriptures but also give you ideas and materials that's going to help you to teach those insights to other people relevant and meaningful ways. And if you find this video helpful, I would uh, ask you to please consider subscribing and sharing it with other people. Now grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Section 12 is very short, but I still believe that you can have a meaningful experience with it. I often introduce it with another scripture study skill. And for an icebreaker, I display the following slide and I ask, what do all of these photos have in common? The answer, if you look really closely at each one, there is something very interesting in the background. The main subject is there and it stands out, but in some cases, what's in the background is even more compelling. Well, in the case of the scriptures, the same can be true. Often, when you examine and explore the background, it can really add to your understanding and insight. And this is especially true when it comes to the Doctrine and Covenants, because the stories behind the revelations aren't always printed directly on the page. It's not like the Book of Mormon or the Bible, where the story is usually right there in front of you in black and white. The Doctrine and Covenants just provides the revelation that came as a result of the story. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a lot of resources out there that can help us to fill in the gap. The section heading can help. Uh, there are church manuals and, and books on the subject. But let me point you to one of the best and easiest ways to access that help. If you have the Gospel Library app, or you're studying from the church website, there's this little icon to the right of the title of each section. It looks like a, a little picture. If you click on that, it will link you to a resource called Revelations in Context. Now these give you a very concise and helpful synopsis and background of the characters and the events surrounding the Revelations. So I encourage you to read those each time you come to a new section, and I can promise you that it's going to make a big difference in your study. Well, section 12 offers us a good example of the power of background. It's directed to an early convert of the church named Joseph Knight Sr. And the story of the Knight family in church history is really fascinating. With so many other stories of early church members that abandoned their faith or fell into apostasy, the Knight family is an example of a group of individuals who stayed true through it all. They remained faithful all the way from Palmyra to Salt Lake. So allow me to give you a short synopsis of the Knight family. Joseph first meets the Knights while working for Josiah Stoll as a young man, who was a business partner with Joseph Knight Sr. And eventually, Joseph Knight and his family are converted. And here are just some of the things that the Knights gave or sacrificed to advance the work of the Restoration. When Joseph and Emma go to retrieve the plates for the very first time, it's in Joseph Knight's carriage that they go. During the translation of the Book of Mormon, Joseph Knight Sr. provided food and paper so that the work could continue. Joseph Knight gave money to Joseph more than once during this time. He supports him financially. After their baptism, the Knight family faces great persecution in Colesville, and some of their property is damaged by mobs. Eventually, he leaves behind his successful farm and mill in Colesville to join with the church members in Kirtland. He's not there for very long because he's forced to leave his home in the Kirtland area because of the apostasy of Lehman Copley. The Knights are among the first families sent to Jackson County, Missouri to establish Zion. And on the way, Polly Knight, Joseph Knight's wife, dies of sickness. She's the first member of the church to die in Missouri. She wouldn't be the last, though. Esther Knight, his daughter, also dies shortly thereafter. 
The Knight family are eventually forced to leave Jackson County, and they settle in Clay County. Now, one of Joseph Knight's son, Newell Knight, also plays prominently in early church history. Newell's newborn son dies that year, as well as his wife Sally, due to the harsh conditions brought on by their hasty removal from Jackson County. Newell travels all the way back to Kirtland to help with the building of the Kirtland Temple, and he remarries there. Then he returns to Missouri, where he starts over in Caldwell County, and then to Nauvoo after the extermination order. Polly Knight, another of Joseph Knight Sr.'s children, is going to die in Nauvoo. Now, after the martyrdom of the prophet, the Knights follow the saints west from Nauvoo, again leaving everything that they've established to start over once again somewhere else. But Newell never makes it to Salt Lake. He dies of pneumonia at Council Bluffs. And then Joseph Knight Sr. dies less than a month later at Mount Pisgah, Iowa. So all in all, seven members of the Knight family will lose their lives during the early days of the Restoration. Now Jesse Knight, Newell's son, who faced all of these hardships as a child and the loss of his father, he continues west with his mother and establishes himself in Utah. He becomes a very successful businessman and he helps the church financially and individual members of the church consistently throughout his life. He gave large endowments to establish Brigham Young University in its early days. And interestingly enough, as an English major at BYU, the majority of my classes and a great deal of my time on that campus was spent studying and learning in the Jesse Knight Humanities Building. Back then, I'm afraid I didn't realize the significance of that name in early church history. Well, just take a look at that list of sacrifices and dedication. This family left an extraordinary legacy for the church. They certainly were knights of the Restoration. I imagine it's likely that even some of you listening may be descendants of the Knight family. And put that in the comments below if you are. And if you are, what an incredible heritage your ancestors gave you and all of us as members of the church. Now with that as a background, what does that add to your study of section 12? Read it and mark any phrases that stand out to you. Now, something that I see is in verse 6. The Lord says to seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. And doesn't that phrase take on a whole new meaning, knowing what you now know with the background? The significance of that sentence is magnified exponentially, isn't it? The Knight family lived that phrase. And when Joseph Knight Sr. received that revelation at the beginning of his journey of faith, I wonder if he really realized the cost of that heavenly instruction. And we often view phrases like that so positively, which we should. But we also have to recognize that establishing the cause of Zion requires sacrifice. And for this family, it was deep sacrifice. They gave so much to establish that cause. Are we willing to make a similar effort in our discipleship? Do we realize that discipleship carries a cost? That establishing Zion isn't free? And verse 7 tells us that this revelation applies to all who have desires to bring forth and establish this work. Now, it probably won't cost us what it costs them, but maybe we could ask ourselves, how can I help to establish the cause of Zion like the Knights? And we can say, if they could endure and give that, then shouldn't I be able to give and endure what's been asked of me? To give my time as a full-time missionary? To offer my best in my church calling? To dedicate 10% of my income to tithing? to sacrifice my own will, to follow the will of the Father. And I believe the Knights can inspire us to do this. And what will help us to give as they gave? We can be humble, full of love, and have faith, hope, charity, temperance, and be trustworthy. 
The Knight family possessed these qualities in spades. And if we wish to accomplish and give even half as much as they did, we too need to develop a measure of those attributes. And then one more phrase. The Knights were certainly a family that gave heed with their might. They didn't just give heed. They gave heed mightily. And I hope that we can follow their amazing example. I also love the fact that Joseph Knight is not really as notable and big a name in early church history and leadership as many others. He's not a Brigham Young, a Sidney Rigdon, a Parley P. Pratt. But instead, he and his family were just an example of a devout, dedicated, and humble Latter-day Saint family who faithfully sought to establish the cause of Zion without notoriety or expectation of any reward. And I hope that we can do the same, that we can be knights and seek to establish the cause of Zion like they did, with all of those qualities that they possessed, and to do it mightily. Doctrine and Covenants, section 13. The section where the section heading is longer than the section itself. Although the importance of this small one-verse section can't be overstated and represents one of the most significant events of the Restoration, and indeed the last 2,000 years. For the first time in centuries, on May 15, 1829, an ordinance was performed under the proper and real authority of God's priesthood power. And as an icebreaker, and to specifically help young people to understand the importance of priesthood authority, I often have them imagine the following scenario. I say, I want you to close your eyes and imagine that you're driving down the freeway in your dream car. Now, since it's your dream car, there's a good possibility you may be driving a little fast. Am I right? I mean, if you're in a Lamborghini, chances are you're not going to want to stay under 65. So you're going a little fast. You've got your music on, sunglasses, just enjoying the drive. When all of a sudden you look to your side and you notice that there's somebody in the car driving next to you trying to get your attention. They're waving their arms and honking. And you recognize them. It's actually me, Brother Wilcox, in my suit and tie. And I'm driving my old Mazda and I'm waving at you and motioning for you to pull over. And you think to yourself, well, I've always known he was a little strange, but okay, I guess I better see what he wants. So you pull over, and I pull up right behind you. And in the rearview mirror, you see me get out of my car slowly and saunter up to the driver's side window, and, and I knock on it. Well, you roll the window down, and you say, Hi, Brother Wilcox. Can I do something for you? And uh, I'm wearing some aviator sunglasses, and I slowly take them off my face, and I say, Um... Do you realize how fast you were going? And you say, uh, no, I'm not really sure. And I say, well, I had to go 85 miles per hour just to keep up with you. And you say, okay, thanks, Brother Wilcox, for the information. Can I go now? And I kind of frown a little bit and I say, you know, I don't think I can let this go this time. And I pull out a pad of sticky notes, and I write on one of them, You are hereby fined to pay $200 for speeding. And I rip off that sticky note and say, Now you drive more carefully. I'll see you next week in class. And I walk back to my car, which has steam coming from the hood because it's not made to go that fast, and I drive away. Well, I've got a question for you. What are you going to do with that ticket? Do you have to pay it? And sometimes my students will say, I'd rip it up. I'd throw it away. I'd ignore it. And I ask them why. I mean, you were speeding. You broke the law. And I legitimately caught you. And I can even say that the reason I did it was because I truly want the streets to be more safe. I'm sincere in my desire. But why don't you have to pay the ticket? And they always get it. It's because I'm not a police officer. I don't have the authority 
to give a ticket. I don't have a badge. I have not been granted that power by those who possess it. And we believe in our society that there's got to be an order to these things. You can't just have anybody out there writing tickets. Well, then I tell them that in a similar but more holy way, that's why we have the priesthood. Because we believe that God is a God of order. And that those who act and teach in his name need to be given authority to do so. That's why we say in the fifth article of faith, we believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinances thereof. Now, while they were translating the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery found the ordinance of baptism mentioned in the plates, and they wondered about it. And we know from Oliver Cowdery's footnote that they had already translated the account of the Savior's ministry to the Nephites. And perhaps 3 Nephi chapter 11, where Jesus teaches the proper method of baptism, prompted this. And it's at this point in the lesson that I like to invite my students to take turns reading Joseph Smith History, verses 68 through 73, out loud as a class. And that describes what happens to Joseph and Oliver as they pray for wisdom on this matter. Now, I won't read that with you here, but I invite you to do that. And then let's return back to section 13. Well, this is a section where we may want to go phrase by phrase to understand it a little better. And what I like to do is this little activity. I assign each student a number from one to four. And then I give each a numbered handout that highlights one of the phrases from section 13. And I ask them to study that phrase, to ponder it, and then be prepared to share something that they learned from their study with the rest of the class. And each handout provides some resources some quotes, some cross-references, to help them to understand it better. And I give them about five minutes to study and prepare. And then I have them share their findings with their group of four. But then you could also have some of the students share their findings with the rest of the class. But here's how I divide up the verse into these four phrases. And when your students share... They're free to share whatever they learned, and, and I'm not going to cover all of the resources that I give them on those handouts, but allow me to just share maybe a thought or two from each. So the first phrase, upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron. Now, I really love that John the Baptist calls them his fellow servants. What a great thought. And I really like the way that they worded it in the Come Follow Me manual for this week. It says this, to be considered a fellow servant with John the Baptist, who baptized the Savior and prepared the way for his coming, must have been humbling, perhaps even overwhelming to these two young men in their twenties. At the time, Joseph and Oliver were relatively unknown, much as harmony was. But service in God's work has always been about how we serve, not about who notices. However small or unseen your contribution may seem at times, you too are a fellow servant in the Lord's great work. Let's move on to number two, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels. Ministering of angels. I don't know about you, but as an ironic priesthood holder, I don't recall any time when an angel appeared to me. So I've wondered about that promise. What could it mean? And I'm not sure that I've got a deeply profound answer to that question, but there are a few quotes from apostles and prophets that can help. Gordon B. Hinckley, With the bestowal of the priesthood comes the right to receive marvelous and wonderful blessings. John declared that the Aaronic priesthood holds the keys of the ministering of angels. How marvelous a gift! That if we live worthily, we shall have the right to the company of angels. Here is protection. Here is guidance. Here is direction. All of these from powers beyond our own natural gifts. Dallin H. Oaks. As a young holder of the Aaronic Priesthood, I did not think I would see an angel, and I wondered what such appearances had to do with the Aaronic Priesthood. But the ministering of angels can also be unseen. 
angelic messages can be delivered by a voice or merely by thoughts or feelings communicated to the mind. And then Jeffrey R. Holland, another take on interpreting the ministering of angels. I have spoken here of heavenly help, of angels dispatched to bless us in time of need. But when we speak of those who are instruments in the hand of God, we are reminded that not all angels are from the other side of the veil. Some of them we walk with and talk with, here, now, every day. Some of them reside in our own neighborhoods. Some of them gave birth to us. And in my case, one of them consented to marry me. Indeed, heaven never seems closer than when we see the love of God manifested in the kindness and devotion of people so good and so pure that angelic is the only word that comes to mind. Well, those are just a few thoughts that might help us to understand the key of the ministering of angels. And phrase number three, and of the gospel of repentance and of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Well, the keys of repentance and baptism in relation to Aaronic priesthood are a little more straightforward. We're used to seeing the Aaronic priesthood act in those particular ordinances, uh, baptism and the sacrament. And both of those ordinances are focused on justifying and purifying us from sin and transgression. The gospel of repentance is evident in those works. Well, baptism and the sacrament purifies us and justifies us and brings us back into a state of worthiness and blamelessness. It allows the power of the atonement to work in our lives. It's only then that the powers and ordinances of the higher priesthood can lift us to a more celestial plane and sanctify us. As the bishop of my ward, one of my roles is to act as the president of the Aaronic priesthood. Bishop is an office in the Aaronic priesthood. Now, I also act with Melchizedek priesthood as well, but my office is Aaronic in nature. So when people come into me to confess and to work through the repentance process, I'm acting in an Aaronic priesthood role. I'm using the keys of the gospel of repentance. Aaronic priesthood justifies, while Melchizedek priesthood sanctifies. That's why the Aaronic priesthood is often referred to as the preparatory priesthood. Its ordinances and offices prepare us for greater spirituality and blessings. And we'll explore that dynamic in a lot more depth when we get to section 84. Now, phrase number four, and this shall never be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. Now, a lot of members wonder about that last phrase. And you'll notice that I gave my students mostly scripture references for this one. And I didn't come up with those on my own. They're all right there in the footnotes. And this is a perfect place to demonstrate the scripture study skill of using the footnotes and cross-references and something that I call a scripture chain. A scripture chain is when you have a list of references and one naturally leads and links to the next, each one adding to your understanding as you follow the chain. So we can use these references to help us understand the meaning of this passage. So first, the sons of Levi. If you go to 1 Chronicles 648, you'll be reminded of what the Levites did in Old Testament times. They were the tribe of Israel that was responsible for performing the ordinances of the temple. It says, Their brethren, also the Levites, were appointed unto all manner of service of the tabernacle of the house of God. And what priesthood power did they hold? Levitical priesthood, or Aaronic priesthood. Now, if you want to go into greater detail on the distinction between the two, there are some slight differences. I invite you to read the definition of Aaronic priesthood written in the Bible dictionary. For our purposes, we're going to say that when section 13 speaks of the sons of Levi, though, it's referring to holders of the Aaronic priesthood. So now what we understand is that Aaronic priesthood holders will someday make an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. Now what we're going to see next is a perfect example of the line upon line, precept upon precept principle. This is the way God worked 
with Joseph all throughout the restoration and, and continues to work this way. He didn't give Joseph a complete understanding of all the facets of the priesthood right at the outset. Over time, and with additional revelation, the meaning and significance of that phrase started to come into view. So let's go to our next reference in the scripture chain. Go to Doctrine and Covenants 84, 31. And we're given additional light there. Section 84 is another very important revelation on the priesthood. And that verse says, Therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation. Ah, so, so now we have an additional group of people and a location. The sons of Moses are included in this body of priesthood holders making the sacrifice. And who were the sons of Moses? Or what priesthood did Moses hold? Well, that would be Melchizedek priesthood. And earlier in that section, we see Moses' line of authority, so to speak, and it indeed stretches back to Melchizedek. So not only will the Aaronic priesthood make this offering, but all priesthood holders will be a part of it. And we now know where it's going to take place, in the temple. Some kind of offering is going to be made in the temple by the priesthood. We still don't know what the offering is, though. So let's finish our scripture chain by going to section 128, verse 24. And here, another group of people participates in the offering, and we finally discover what it is. Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand, and who can abide the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So there's our signal. We're talking about this offering spoken of by John the Baptist way back at the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. That matching language signals it. Let us, therefore, as a church and a people and as Latter-day Saints, offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So who do we get to add to our group now? Every member of the church. It's not just priesthood holders. Men, women, youth, any Latter-day Saint that wishes to take part in this great work. And together, as a people, we make an offering. And where do we do it? And let us present in his holy temple. We offer it in the temple. But what is it? When it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. The offering is the work that we've done for the dead, our temple work. When Christ returns, he's going to ask for that offering. And I don't know, maybe instead of a book, it'll be a stack of hard drives. But we will present the names of all those for whom we have done the work of salvation. And it will be worthy of his acceptation. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is the only manifestation of the fulfillment of that prophecy. God often fulfills things in multiple ways. And that offering could also refer to the offering of a broken heart and a contrite spirit or the offering of our covenants within the temple. And I've heard a few other possible interpretations. However, I do believe that the offering as a book of our temple work to be the major fulfillment of that phrase in section 13. So right from the beginning of the restoration of the priesthood, God is already pointing to the work for the dead. It may even suggest that one of the major reasons we even have priesthood on the earth is so that we can do that work. It harkens back to section 2 as the first written and canonized revelation of this dispensation, chronologically speaking. And that section was all about the work for the dead. Both Moroni and John the Baptist had their eye on temple work from the beginning. And a few questions that you might consider asking your students 
to help them apply this section. How have you been blessed by the keys of the Aaronic Priesthood, the ministering of angels, repentance, and baptism? And have you contributed to the great offering recently? And what can you do to more fully engage in the work for the dead? Well, I testify that the power of the priesthood is real. I've seen what it can do. I've had the privilege to be blessed by it and the privilege of blessing others with it. And I'm grateful that our Heavenly Father is a God of order and has provided us with the framework of authority to work under and in and with. It is an amazing and sobering thing to think that God is willing to trust us enough to take on a portion of his incredible power and authority. And I believe that what happened on the banks of the Susquehanna River on May 15, 1829, stands as a testament to God's mercy, trust, and love for his children. And I testify that I know it happened because I have personally felt the power that has flowed down through the generations from that moment to me. I testify that it's real. Now let's shift back to Joseph Smith history to look at a few final ideas. There is a brief insight I'd like to point out here at the end of Joseph's account, and he makes a really remarkable statement about the Holy Ghost in verses 73 to 74. He says that after they were baptized, we were filled with the Holy Ghost and rejoiced in the God of our salvation. Our minds being now enlightened, we began to have the scriptures laid open to our understandings. And the true meaning and intention of their more mysterious passages revealed unto us in a manner which we never could attain to previously, nor ever before had thought of. So he tells us that with the Holy Ghost, now they could understand the scriptures in a way that they never could before. The reason I find that so remarkable is because, well, what did Joseph have in his possession at the time to help him understand the scriptures and receive intelligence from God. He had the Urim and Thummim, this special instrument provided by God to aid him in revelation and translation. He still has it in his possession at this time because they're still in the midst of translating the plates. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I would love to have a Urim and Thummim. How helpful would that be? Maybe it would make preparing these lessons easier. But according to this, Bearing the gift of the Holy Ghost is even more effective at helping us connect with the intelligence of God. Of those two means, which has God made available to all of us that have been baptized by the authority and the power of the priesthood? We have the more powerful one. We may not have a personal Urim and Thummim in our possession, but we do have the gift of the Holy Ghost. And with its help, it can lay open the true meaning and intention of the scriptures in a way that just isn't possible without it. And a quick side note. I know there's a lot of modern criticism leveled at Joseph and his use of sacred objects or physical instruments imbued with spiritual powers. The Urim and Thummim, his seer stone, and, and at this time, even Oliver Cowdery carries with him a divining rod of sorts that apparently held some measure of sacred power. I know I didn't mention it a few weeks ago, but the original version of Doctrine and Covenants section 8 referred to this rod of Oliver's. The current version refers to it as the gift of Aaron, but it originally spoke of his rod of nature, or the sprout. Now, the modern skeptic is going to laugh at that kind of thing. They mock the images of Joseph in his hat with the stone inside, Oliver and his divining rod, but I believe that God works with and speaks to people according to their understanding and culture. Joseph Smith's culture at the time was steeped in this kind of thing. Sacred objects, magic, divining rods, seer stones. Well, God used those things to act as a sort of stepping stone, no pun intended, into a more mature understanding of the things of the Spirit. Eventually, Joseph won't need the Urim and Thummim to translate or to receive revelations. Most of the future revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants are going to come through the Holy Ghost. 
The mention of Oliver's rod of nature is changed to the gift of Aaron. It's evidence of their spiritual maturation. Just like the expression of testimony of a returned missionary is going to differ from the testimony of a primary child. And the testimony of a 60-year-old lifelong member of the church is going to differ from the testimony of the returned missionary. There is a maturing of understanding and experience. This is what happens to Joseph. But the physical objects helped these early leaders to make that transition. It was the kind of experience that they could understand. And also, consider the fact that we still continue to believe in and use sacred physical objects that aid in spiritual understanding. We partake of actual bread and water in the sacrament to teach us the nature of Christ's sacrifice. We give priesthood blessings with consecrated oil. We wear CTR rings to give us strength against temptation. And temple clothing carries loads of symbolic significance. It's not that we... We need to imbue these objects with mystical or otherworldly powers. But they teach us and they aid our spiritual learning. That's why object lessons can be so effective. They can help us to grasp some of the more abstract doctrines and principles of the gospel. So I don't think it's quite fair for us to criticize or dismiss Joseph's divine prophetic calling because of his use of these kinds of things. And speaking of object lessons, I'd like to focus on one more idea or lesson with you. And it comes from this footnote of Oliver Cowdery's, included at the end of Joseph Smith History. I call it the footnote, or the mother of all footnotes. I mean, look at the size of it. Now, what I love about this is if you remember our lesson a few weeks ago, Oliver really wanted to translate scripture. He asks for the opportunity. He tries and fails, and he doesn't end up translating any portion of the Book of Mormon. But it's almost as if God said, Oliver, I know how much you wanted to add some scripture to the Latter-day Canon, and it was a good desire. Now, you weren't able to translate from the gold plates, but you know what? I'll give you a footnote, and you can make it as long as you want. So Oliver does actually get something into the scriptures, doesn't he? It's just a footnote, but it's quite a footnote. And I think that Oliver really hits a home run here. There are some beautiful ideas and phrases here. And to be fair, he does stumble just a little bit as he rounds the bases. At certain points, you get the sense that he's starting to wax eloquent. And his style is very different from Joseph's. It's not that straightforward, present the facts kind of writing. There's a real contrast between the two. Maybe even a bit of promoting religious feeling here. But I think we can forgive him because, well, that's how they wrote back then. And you do sense his sincerity. And there are some really magnificent ideas in here. And to introduce his footnote, I like to do this little object lesson. I bring in a level. You know, the kind that have the little bubble in the tube. And I ask, what do we use this for? And they'll say things like, uh, it's used to balance things, to put things straight and to make them level. Pictures, beams in construction, shelves. I just used one of these things a few weeks ago to install some shelves for my daughter, to hold all the things that she's built out of Legos. And what might happen if you don't use a level in these kinds of projects? Things will get out of alignment. They'll be crooked. The structure won't be as strong. And in the case of a shelf, things might slide off and get broken. Well, let's focus on that image of a level shelf that represents our lives. And what do we put up there on that shelf? Faith, testimony, belief, a commitment to God. As long as our shelf is in balance or level, we'll be safe. But what's Satan going to try to do? He's always seeking to tip that balance, to weigh down one side in the hopes that he can unbalance our lives and cause our faith and testimony and commitment to slide off and come crashing to the ground. Now, to counteract that attack, we need to make sure that we're giving God ample opportunities 
to place weight and substance and truth on the other side of the shelf to keep our lives in balance and our faith intact. God will never let us fall if we give him that opportunity. So in this footnote, Oliver is going to describe his experience with the visit of John the Baptist and his ordination to the Aaronic Priesthood. And what I love about this is that Oliver clearly delineates between these two sides. Now we're going to focus our attention on this second page of text, the final four paragraphs. And as you read these four paragraphs, I want you to have this sheet of paper nearby and write down all the words and phrases that suggest the kinds of things and feelings that Satan is going to attempt to place on the shelf of our life to tip our balance. And on the other side, I want you to write down all the things and feelings that God gives to help restore our balance and keep us level and steady in our discipleship. Or you could take two different colored pencils and mark the two sides as you study. And let's see what you find. Now, I'm not going to take the time to read each paragraph word for word with you. I'm going to invite you to pause the video and do that yourself. And I believe that you'll have a powerful experience if you read slowly and prayerfully. I hope that you'll be able to feel the power of Oliver's testimony here. And I'll borrow an expression from Alma the Younger and say that he's singing the song of redeeming love. This was an intense spiritual experience for him. As you can imagine, it's, it's not every day you meet John the Baptist. But let's see what you can find. And if you did that, what did you mark and why? And in a class, I'd allow my students to share some of their words and phrases and then discuss them. And here are some of the possible things that they might have found. For Satan's side of the balance, his darkness covers the earth. Gross darkness covers our minds. Great strife and noise concerning religion. Denying revelation. The world is racked and distracted, groping as the blind for the wall, all men resting upon uncertainty, fear, doubt, fiction, deception. And in the last paragraph, he describes the world like this. Man may deceive his fellow men, deception may follow deception, and the children of the wicked one may have power to seduce the foolish and untaught till naught but fiction feeds the many, and the fruit of falsehood carries in its current the giddy to the grave. Now, Oliver gets a little alliterative there, doesn't he? But that's what I would put on the Satan side. But what goes on our other side? What does God have to place on the other side of our shelf to help level us? The Lord is rich in mercy, ever willing to answer, he condescends to manifest his will to us. The voice of the Redeemer speaks peace to us. He parts the veil and delivers anxiously looked for messages. He fills us with joy, wonder, amazement. Our ears hear things, our eyes behold. He sheds the brilliancy of his light on us. His mild voice pierces us to the center dispels every fear, causes us to rejoice, and we feel his love enkindled upon our souls. Uncertainty will flee, doubt will sink no more to rise, fiction and deception will flee forever, joy will fill our hearts, and he'll surround us with majestic beauty and glory. And I love this phrase, nor has this earth power to give the joy to bestow the peace or comprehend the wisdom which was contained in each sentence as they were delivered by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then later, one touch with the finger of his love, rays of glory from the upper world, words from the mouth of the Savior from the bosom of eternity, assurance, certainty, wonder, and thanksgiving. Now, they might have found other things, but those are some of the things that I might highlight. Now, let's liken the scriptures. 
Can you relate in any way to Oliver's description here? Is our world similar to the one that he's describing? Do we find gross darkness in our world? Are there individuals out there that deny revelation, tell us that our scriptures are a sham and our prophets are frauds? Are there people who seek to deceive their fellow man? Does deception follow deception? Are the children of the wicked given power to seduce the foolish and the untaught? Do we live in a world where fiction feeds the many? It's a perfect description of the internet. And where the fruit of falsehood carries in its current the giddy to the grave. Can we relate? Have you ever experienced these feelings? Fear, doubt, uncertainty. Have you ever felt darkness covering your mind? Have you ever heard the great strife and noise about religion? Have you ever felt racked, distracted, like you were blind, groping for something? Just as the Holy Ghost speaks to our minds with faith and fills our hearts with peace, the adversary speaks doubt to the mind and fear to the heart. And at this time, the faith of many members of Christ's church is being tested in a way unlike any time before. And unfortunately, there have been a number who have succumbed to the deception, the seduction, the fiction, and the fruit of falsehood. They've allowed their shelves to be filled so much with these things or have given too much audience to that side that it has tipped them out of balance. The level has shifted and their faith and commitment has come tumbling down and shattered to pieces on the ground. So what can we do? We allow the Lord to balance things out with the things on the other side. We give him space and time and focus to do so. We spend time in the scriptures like Joseph and Oliver are doing here as they're translating the Book of Mormon. And like them, we kneel in prayer to the Lord who is rich in mercy and ever willing to answer the consistent prayer of the humble. After we call upon him in a fervent manner, aside from the abodes of men. If we give the Lord that space through all the little things that he asks of us, scripture study, prayer, general conference, church, temple worship, ordinances, then he will condescend to manifest his will to us. The voice of the Redeemer will speak peace to us. The veil will be parted and he will fill us with joy, wonder, amazement, peace, and love. The light of heaven will shed its brilliancy on us. Every fear will be dispelled. Uncertainty will flee. Doubt will sink no more to rise. Fiction and deception will flee forever. When all the darkness and the doubt and the fear and uncertainty surround us, we just need to turn to the Lord in prayer or keep in our minds the vivid memory of these kinds of experiences that I believe God grants to all who turn to him. Perhaps my favorite part of this whole footnote is that concluding thought of Oliver's. All we really need in those moments of darkness and uncertainty is one touch with the finger of his love. Yea, one ray of glory from the upper world or one word from the mouth of the Savior, from the bosom of eternity, strikes it all into insignificance and blots it forever from the mind. The assurance that we were in the presence of an angel, the certainty that we heard the voice of Jesus, and the truth unsullied as it flowed from a pure personage, dictated by the will of God, is to me past description. And I shall ever look upon this expression of the Savior's goodness with wonder and thanksgiving while I am permitted to tarry. And in those mansions where perfection dwells and sin never comes, I hope to adore in that day which shall never cease. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life? The touched by the finger of his love and ray of glory moments. I believe in a loving Heavenly Father who provides these kinds of thoughts and feelings and experiences at critical times in our lives. Sometimes they're big, sometimes they're small answered prayers, minor miracles, assurances, 
thoughts and feelings that come as we study the scriptures or listen to the prophets or worship in church or the temple. God gives us these things to help us balance out and overcome the darkness and the uncertainty. It reminds me of this passage from the Chronicles of Narnia in The Magician's Nephew. When the children meet and speak with Aslan, who's a symbol for Jesus, they've been touched by the finger of his love and they felt that ray of glory from him. And it says this, Both the children were looking up into the lion's face as he spoke these words. And all at once, they never knew exactly how it happened. The face seemed to be as a sea of tossing gold in which they were floating. And such a sweetness and power rolled about them and over them and entered them that they felt that they had never really been happy or wise or good or even alive and awake before. And the memory of that moment stayed with them always, so that as long as they both lived, if they ever were sad or afraid or angry, the thought of all that golden goodness and the feeling that it was still there, quite close, just round some corner or just behind some door, would come back and make them sure, deep down inside, that all was well. Isn't that beautiful? It's a perfect description of the kind of moment that Oliver is describing. And at that point, I would ask my class, have you ever had a touched by the finger of his love, ray of glory, golden goodness experience? And would you be willing to share? Now, I know that I've had those kinds of moments in my life, those golden goodness moments times when I received answers to my prayers, the day I was baptized, the day I received the priesthood, miracles that I've witnessed, feeling the guidance and wisdom of the Lord flow through me as I give priesthood blessings, the influence of the Spirit confirming the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon to me, and Joseph Smith and the Savior, seeing investigators enter the waters of baptism, the day I was married, beautiful and happy memories with my family, my children, my wife, experiences that I've had in nature, the flashes of inspiration and insight and truth as I've studied and taught from the scriptures, the way that I always feel in the temple, and on and on and on. I am so grateful for those times when God has seen fit to part the veil just a crack and shine one of those rays of glory on me, or reach out and touch me with the finger of his love for just a moment. And I know that he will give those same kinds of things to those who are willing to give him the time and the opportunity. So the truth, if I give my time, attention, and will to him, then God will give me touches of his love and rays of his glory that can dispel my fears, sink my doubts, chase away my uncertainties, and strike them all into insignificance. Well, I love that footnote. You really get the sense that Oliver is overwhelmed with emotion and the faith of the memory of that moment. And you know, Oliver is going to face some challenges and some dark times of his own in the future. At one point, he's even going to leave the church and abandon the saints. But he comes back. And I wonder if it was the memory of experiences like this that inspired and helped him to return. And if you've strayed, maybe the same kind of thing can help you as well. Think back to your ray of glory moments. And I hope that you and I, when we're faced with the gross darkness that covers the earth, that we'll still be able to recognize the joy, the wisdom, the touches of love, the rays of glory, the voice of the Redeemer speaking peace. And I testify that those experiences will cause your fears to be dispelled, your uncertainties to flee, your doubts to sink no more to rise, and they will take the adversary's efforts and strike them into insignificance and blot them forever from your mind. May we all 
sing the song of redeeming love and be filled with wonder and thanksgiving and one day adore in those mansions where perfection dwells and sin never comes. That is my sincere hope and prayer for all of you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a privilege to have the time to share these thoughts from the scriptures with you. If you're interested in the slide presentation that I used here or the handouts that I make or the lesson plans that I put together, go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to those resources. If you found this lesson helpful, please subscribe, hit the thumbs up, make a comment, share it with those that you feel it could help. Thank you for watching. And as always, get out there and teach with power.